Alright, the distance problem, part 2 of 5.1. Now let's consider the distance problem. Find the distance traveled by an object during a certain time period if the velocity of the object is known at all times. If the velocity remains constant, then the distance problem is easy to solve by means of the formula. Distance equals velocity times time. You may have seen this as distance equals rate times time. But if the velocity varies, it's not easy to find the distance traveled. Well, unless we use calculus. All right, so here's example four. Suppose the odometer of your car is broken and we want to estimate the distance driven over a 30 second time interval. We take speedometer readings every five seconds and record them in the following table. So time in seconds, 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Velocity, miles per hour, 17, 21, 24, 29, 32, 31, 28. All right. But in order to have the time and the velocity in consistent units, let's convert the velocity readings to feet per second. All right. Reason being is your time is in seconds and your velocity is in hours. All right, so what we're going to do to our chart, for example, what I did with my first velocity, okay, velocity 17, I'm going to multiply it by how many feet are in a mile, 5,280, and divide it by 3,600. Now, where does 3,600 come from? Remember, we're going to convert hours down to minutes, that's 60 minutes per one hour. And then there's another 60 seconds for every minute. So 60 times 60 is 3,600. So what I did is grab my calculator. I took my number, 17 times 5280 divided by 360. I'll be honest with you. I stored this for X in my calculator, and I typed in 17X, which was really close to 25. 21x, 31, 24x, 35, 29x, 43, 32x, 47, 31x, 45, 28x, 41. And so these, again, these are all approximations, just rounding it to the nearest velocity, which is going to be now measured in feet per second. So now that my times are the same in my data, I can go ahead and estimate the distance we travel. All right, so our change in x is going to be every five seconds. Now, the downside here is that we can't use the midpoint formula because, sure, we could tell the time is 2.5, but we didn't take a reading there, so we can't use that. All right, so if we plot our points, kind of did a little graph here real quick, connected them together, and we're going to do some rectangles here. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six possible rectangles. So if we go with a left endpoint, that's what capital L stands for again. Left endpoint would be when T is zero. And we were traveling at that particular time, 17 miles per hour, that we converted to 25 feet per second, draw that straight across, then straight down. There's our rectangle. So that's going to be base 5 times the height of 25. That's the first upper left-hand corner. Then we're going to do our next rectangle. Upper left-hand corner at 5 gives me 31. Then plus 5 times 35 plus 5 times 43, plus 5 times 47, plus 5 times 45. Notice we're not using the very last entry here. We have seven possible values here, but we only have six rectangles. So crunching the numbers, in your calculator, it gives me 11, oh, excuse me, 1,130 feet were traveled. But again, 
if you notice, this would be an underestimation because we have four intervals where area is missing, and we have only two that's an overestimate, which say maybe this triangle on our last interval might be close to being the same here, but this one doesn't match up with anything, so this one's coming up short. If we go R sub 6, let's do a right upper endpoint. Now we're going to use the last six values. Our first rectangle in the upper right hand corner will have the 5 on the graph. So 5 times 31 plus 5 times 35 plus 5 times 43 plus 5 times 47 plus 5 times 45 plus 5 times 41. So you should see a trend here. Whenever you do the left endpoint, you never use the last data entry. When you use a right endpoint, you never use the first. All right, crunching the numbers here. That's 1,210 feet. Again, if you notice, we have an overestimated value. Yep, maybe this one will fit in here. And then this little sliver here, oh, I don't know, it's, well, those other three are too big. So it's somewhere in between. All right, so the area under our curve, like we said, that's the distance traveled. If this was a constant rate, then you would have one big, huge rectangle, and you would just go the height of that rectangle times the entire base, and that's going to be your distance traveled. <clears throat> All right, so the figures below show an approximation for n equals 2, 4, 8, and 12 rectangles. Notice that the approximation appears to become better and better as the number of stripes increase. That means your number of your rectangles. That is, if we can get the number of our rectangles to approach infinity, now we're going to get an exact value for our area. We won't have such big missing chunks or a lot of overestimation, what, you know, whatever the case may be. So therefore, we're going to define the area of the region S in the following way. The area A of the region S that lies under the graph of the continuous function F. That's important. You can't all of a sudden say, oh, look, come on, mouse. We can't have all of a sudden a vertical asymptote show up. Then how do we touch the curve? Okay, we can't have an open circle somewhere. It has to be continuous. So a continuous function f is the limit of the sum of the areas of approximating rectangles as they go to infinity. Now here, notice that it says the limit of capital R sub n. So we do right endpoints. So we ignore that first a. We start with x sub 1. So the key here, the key concept here is thinking about, I'm going to go over here to where n is 12. If I make these rectangles smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where, let's just say for giggles, that the length of, or I should say, excuse me, the width of this line right here is the width of one of my rectangles. So I get all these lines side by side hitting that curve. Now there's no missing area. Well, in order to do that, n has to go to infinity. So we'll start with the very first value after a, and then until we get to b. So, and it doesn't matter, to be perfectly honest with you, you could put down the limit as n approaches infinity for capital L sub n. It will still come out to be the same because your slivers are so narrow you don't miss anything anymore. All right, so we'll pick up more in our next sections video.